It's a story about two women, one in the present day, with the very recent past, and one in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and beyond. I loved the way the script flip-flopped between a modern-day story and a period story, and that the two kind of mirrored each other and kept pace with each other. Definitely M's process in the beginning w was very much about, you know, reading, education, learning, absorbing this, this world. To create this look of this film, we had tons of books, we saw tons of pictures, and of course, a lot of blueprints of other films. There are books that Madonna used when she was writing the, the script, uh, books of the letters, and they're amazing, they're just fascinating. It's refreshing to read a script that has such strong, interesting female characters as, at its centre. I think it's unquestionable that the film is female strong in the sense that the leads are both female <laughs> and that the director's female. Okay, ladies, are you ready? Perfect. Good. Check Very the good. gate. Good. What I liked about the script was the way that it was written. It, it kept the period flashbacks very real, very honest, very immediate. Seeing an historical figure through the eyes of a modern day woman, and then on the flip side, being able to relate to a woman in the late 1930s who was about to potentially become a, a queen. I thought it was a very fascinating take on a very interesting chapter in the British monarchy's history and a very human quest for true love. There's always certain things that attract you to a film, uh, you know, the story, uh, the character, the creative team. So for me, the story, you know, about, about the search for love, about the journey of one soul, I think is a beautiful tale to tell. I was always fascinated by the story of the Duke and the Duchess. Every time I'd go out to dinner, I'd bring up their name at a dinner party, and it would be like throwing a Molotov cocktail into the, the, onto the table. Suddenly, the table would erupt, and everyone would get into an argument about who they were. As I read their story, my feelings toward them kept changing. One minute, I was, you know, enthralled and swept up in it, and then the next minute, I, I was kind of, um, irritated with them and thinking of them as superficial. And then the next minute I thought, oh my God, they're human beings like all of us. This guy gave up the throne. What drove him to do that? If it was for a woman and if it was for love, what did this woman have? The role that I play in the film is the role of Edward or David to his family, or the Prince of Wales, then the King to the general public, or then the Duke of Windsor. He had several different names in his life, but I suppose most famous now for being the man who abdicated the throne in the 20th century. One thing that is for sure is that Edward was one of the greatest celebrities. I mean, this is the beginning of celebritydom. He was absolutely worshipped, adored, fawned over. He was a major, major sex symbol. In fact, if you mentioned his name to my grandmother, she'd have to sit down. What I think must be true is that he was madly in love with her, maybe desperately in love with her. If you've given up the empire for somebody, then, God, that better be the right person. Casting Wallace Simpson was almost impossible because she's so specific. Her persona, her energy, her, you know, the way she spoke, the way she held herself. When Andrea Riceboro walked in the room, I immediately knew she was the one. When I spoke to various people about meeting her, they all said, oh no, she's too young. But the great thing about Andrea is that she has a face that can play a range of ages and a range of emotion. And I found working with her extraordinary. I'm playing Wallace from 28 to 70. So, you know, you get a lot of the 70, but what was she when she was younger? Well, you see like real sort of, you see cine footage of her getting on and off boats and her and Edward together and not being relaxed. 
And the interesting thing is what happens when you imagine what they're like, just those two, just we two in a private space. To my grandma, she was just this sort of American woman who'd taken away this king, who, who was the first king really to fight for the common man. I just remember thinking that her spirit must have been such that she was compelling enough that he needed to be with her. It's a story about a person who loved another person enough to devote their entire life to making them happy. What we weren't interested in doing is just recreating Wallace Simpson. We were interested in how she was useful to Abby's character, really, to w Wally's character. Wally and Wallace have an extraordinary relationship in the sense that Wally's obsessed with the idea of Wallace's life and how perfect this ideal love seemed to be that she had with Edward. This is Wally's imagination of what she thinks their relationship might have been like. One of the reasons I cast Abby was because there's a strength about her as an actress when she doesn't say anything. Carrying her whole story and to be able to embody that and give it more than 100%, you know, I, I felt it did really consume me and still is consuming me. It was important for me to create a character that was also trapped in a relationship that was not rooted in love. Because she married for security, she's longing for love. And a lot of people marry for love and they're longing for security. So this is the conundrum. Wally's in her late 20s in an unhappy marriage. She lives in New York in the late 90s and is in the process of figuring out what she wants to do with the rest of her life. In many ways, Wally doesn't have a voice. She's much more of a voyeur that goes through life, living vicariously through objects and through the Duchess. I decided to use the items from the auction as a device to go back and forth in time, from a martini shaker to a pillbox, a beautiful linen tablecloth, because each item, I felt, told a story. She goes on this journey thinking it was the greatest love story and, oh my God, how could this man give up such a powerful position only to realize that it wasn't such a perfect love. She's been living in an environment that's so kind of dark and suppressed. They've been married for about six years. They want to have a child. She's given up her job to focus on having a baby. And as that becomes more imminent, things really start to fall apart. They are, to all intents and purposes, a celebrated society couple. He is a very successful, hotshot child psychiatrist. They live in a beautiful apartment in the Upper West Side, and they have it all, you know, so it seems. But actually, they don't have it all. They have a lot of issues. He can't deal with her independent spirit, her needs. She's stuck inside this fabulous apartment that has no joy and no love. She's looking for an escape. She needs a fantasy. When she meets Evgeny, their friendship is just so open and so free. They're almost like two kids. They just speak their minds to each other. I play Evgeny Kolpakov, who is a Ukrainian immigrant. He's working as a security guard in Sotheby's. Evgeny and Wally are both lost souls when they when they find each other they're both you know he's in a kind of mourning uh, he's lost his wife i don't think he's terribly challenged or happy about the job he has and she's not happy either and they find each other when i first read the script what i liked the most about the character was there's a mysterious quality to him and his sense of humor is very dry so you're never really sure where you stand with him he's actually a pianist and a sensitive artist and uh, ends up falling in love with Wally. The scenes are very intimate and all about two people who immediately are just comfortable together. And particularly Abby, I don't know anyone that's quite as, as comfortable in their skin as she is. You know, just completely up, always at ease. And that was just invaluable. Wallace Simpson famously wore 
uh, designers like Schiaparelli, Mambache, Valentino, Christian Dior. She had an incredible aesthetic. I mean, her style was something that was just so brave. She was so bold in her style. They were fashion icons and still live on to this day as fashion icons and have inspired many fashion designers and lots of fashion collections. They're kind of a wealth of inspiration. She had every fashion house from Scaffarelli to Balenciaga to Christian Dior creating these magnificent dresses and clothes for her. I have the great fortune to wear the most extraordinary costumes in this film. And they're all exquisite and it's like architecture to me. Doing research with Ariane was really fun too, going to the Victoria and Albert Museum and looking in the archives of the Duke and the Duchess and touching their clothes and seeing them. v recreated four dresses for us. We have a beautiful hand-beaded chiffon, gorgeous gown that we use in the party scene when they're all taking Benzedrine cocktails. We also have another beautiful dress that v made for us from the Fort Belvedere scene that's silver and gold lame. There's only one seam in this dress. It's really, really beautiful. And then we went to Christian Dior, which I think was fantastic and really homaged the relationship between Christian Dior, Wallace Simpson, and brought it into our world. Andrea Reiserbrer has 50 costume changes in this movie. James Darcy has 30. Abby Cornish has 40 costume changes. It's just a hungry movie for costumes. We have so many costumes. So every day on set is a, a fashion moment. Turn over. Hey, camera. Yeah. Action. As you can see, I'm not quite as chic as uh, Andrea is in the film. She had her own style, Elizabeth, <laughs> and it sort of lived on for generations. There's a scene in our film where Queen Elizabeth is having a hat fitting. When I read the script, I said, oh my goodness, Stephen Jones has got to play this part. Now, I was amazed when I got the phone call one day from Madonna saying, could I be in the film? I mean, it was incredible and such an honor. That actually having Stephen Jones put the hats on your head in a scene is pretty special. <laughs> <laughs> it's good when you have a laugh. Good. Right, there you go. And it looks lovely on top of that hat. <laughs> the jewelry alone is just such a huge part of our film. So we worked with Cartier. For Cartier, it was very interesting to have such clients like, like her. You set trends with those kind of women. The Duke spent a lot of money for her, but she also had this taste for jewelry. The Duchess of Windsor was the first to purchase those kind of uh, three-dimension items. One cross, the Emerald Cross, Edward gives to Wallace when they're on the beach in Cannes. After we'd finished the scene, Andrew suddenly said, oh, wait a minute, the bracelet with all the other crosses on it, I, I've lost it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much that thing was worth, but that's somewhere down in about two feet of the Mediterranean, the south of France, if you want to go looking for it. The great thing for me is Madonna really cares about visuals and she really understands costumes. I mean, we have a director that understands couture from the most visceral standpoint of having worn it herself. Her heart is in a place that is so passionate and so excited about the project that it's difficult not to be swept up by that and want to go the extra mile. It's just been intensive and I like how all encompassing it's been, you know, and nothing's taken for granted. I spent about a month and a half working every day with piano teachers, learning by rote, because I've never played piano before, just learning how to play. And for me, there was French speaking, piano playing, dancing. I've done a lot of classical ballet, so I enjoyed that a lot. Joan Washington, who's an amazing voice coach, she's very specific with each character. And so I would do my work, watching research footage, etc., and we would kind of meet and she'd have done hers and we'd create something that would be right in each specific time period for Wallace. Edward was 
pretty much like an all-rounder, so he, there was a lot of riding and bagpipe playing. Went clay pigeon shooting three times a week. Full prosthetics. I think we started at six this morning. Went dancing every day. I was continuously involved in some learning of some discipline, which massively helped. And really, within all of that, the most important thing is that you kind of learn it and forget it. And then the moment that she can push us to where we need to be dramatically. The more experience an actor has, the easier it is for me, the director, because then you're just turning a dial. I was lucky to have a lot of people that fit that description. We're here in Paris in the uh, new model Citroen here. OK. The uh, reclining mode. Let's go. Ready to do Let's some uh, more gorilla filming. This film is really ambitious. There's so many scenes. I think we have over 40 locations. We shot in London, and we shot in the countryside of England. We shot in Wales, and we shot in Manhattan, and we shot in Brooklyn. And we shot in Paris, and we shot in the south of France. Nice, comfy ride. My holiday is about to begin. Woohoo! And she's going to miss you. I know my mommy, she's going to grieve. Go, be productive. We all know the first take's going to suck anyway, so we might as well shit. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. And he got the money, and he got the talk, and the fancy walk, yes, the suit New York. It's love, it's love, it's love alone. Hold on, I'm thinking I'm putting some socks on. Me crown. Believe me, Miss Simpson, do renown. He says love, love, is love alone. She made me run about a mile. So today, working with her makes me want to kill her. My dad is playing my dad. Dangerous casting, one might say. I think Ron Lawrence will be terrified of me because I'm a very, very imposing father. It was bloody beautiful till you woke me up. I did say to James Fox that I was going to get my mum to come and play the Queen, just to balance it up a bit. But my mum's a nurse. Bill Blue, what are we waiting for? Okay. Don't get me upset. Give me a sugary upset. snack, Foggy, immediately. <laughs> What's it? <There's> love alone, <laughs> so today we're shooting the scene where everyone's watching an old movie and they spice up the cocktails and everyone gets to have a little fun. We're probably gonna have more fun than we should have, but um, this will be the scene when everybody gets to let loose. And he got the money, and he got the talk, and the fancy walk, just to suit New York. It's love, it's love, it's love alone, costing at to eat You can't take me throne, you can't take me crown. Believe me, Miss Simpson, to renown. He says, love, it's love, it's love alone, costing at to eat One of the things that I love that I'm obsessed with is camera movement. Because my training is originally as a dancer, when I thought about choreographing the study cam, you have to rehearse it. It's an animal. It's a creature that lives on the set. You need to see him shoving her. She doesn't want to go. I want to see her knees. There is a lot of movement in my film, which wasn't necessarily intentional, although a lot of the movies that I was inspired by had a lot of movement, camera-wise. I also didn't know it at the time, but now when I w watch the movie, I say, wow, there's a lot of dancing in my movie, but I also wasn't conscious of that when I was writing the script. Come a real, come a roll up on my mind. I cannot leave the Simpson behind. So there's actual people dancing. Dancing. And then, in, in some respects, there's a sort of lyricism and a lot of movement to the camera. Madonna is a very demanding director, so she wants to try a lot of things, she never satisfied with, uh, let's say, conventional 
type of filmmaking. We are following this way, you know what I mean? Yeah. The two of them interact. Okay, good. Or here oh, and here. I think it's better. Yeah. Then they have a real yeah. okay, connection let's, let's to it. Let's do that. I decided to use 16 millimeter as a sort of punctuation to kind of whenever I wanted to go in close for something intimate. And then, of course, we used Super 8 a lot, but more to evoke a feeling of nostalgia, because whenever you see Super 8 footage, you think home movies. Somebody made this on their own. And so we used that as, you know, flashbacks, almost as if somebody else had been filming that stuff. To see what you can get and what is right for the flashbacks, what is right for this camera, for that camera, and Madonna hired me so I can translate it if she said, oh, I don't know how to do it, but this is what I want. Let's try one more and, and this time be very, very restrained. I think the major input comes from the director. It's through discussions and days and nights and days and nights. And there is no stone unturned. Ems read every publication that there's been about Wallace and I think understands her in a very specific way. I wanted to give the actors as much information as I could, give them as much guidance and input as I could, and have as much rehearsal as we could. As soon as I came on board, Emma inundated me with all this wealth of information, you know, and just said, here's Wally, she's in here. You get emails from her at two in the morning, and then you get another one at six in the morning. I don't know how she's doing it, because she's not sleeping. I really like working with Madonna. Is it Madonna? Emma Chudo, what do I call her? Uh, she is, uh, she's lovely. She's really good. She gets some very good direct actor's notes. She would come over and whisper things, you know, little private notes based in emotion, and she had notes that were technical. And that's, that's really a, a brilliant combination. I just knew from the first moment that I met her that she needed to tell a story. If you're going to work with somebody, the best reason to do it is because they need to tell it, and that becomes infectious, and then you need to tell it and then it becomes an incredibly important thing. She's so down to earth and she's so focused on the job in hand. And, you know, who better to analyze the joys and the pitfalls of celebrity and living in the public eye than Madonna, for God's sakes. She has an insight that very few people on this planet do. And what? I had the most amazing steady cam operator. Ah! I'm not your steady cam. I had the most talented cinematographer, the greatest costume designer, hair and makeup production designer. I had an amazing crew. And when you surround yourself with great people, you're going to rise up if you just pay attention. If people walk out of the theater and go, wow, I, I didn't know that about the Duke and the Duchess, or I didn't know that, that about Wallace Simpson, or I didn't think that way, or, you know, I was in a relationship like that that I couldn't get out of, or, you know, whatever. If, if, it, if people can connect on any one of those levels, I'll, I'll be very happy.